commissioned to kind of take on a special project, I'll call it. And, and, you know, it's really to kind of address the issues of what are currently happening in our society and to really share some perspective on how those things are impacting different groups of people and in particular Black people as we go through this experience. And so I'm just going to share a little perspective with you and hopefully throughout that experience, you'll be able to walk away with a few ideas that you can take with you, but also some things you can tangibly do to help and then yeah. really make a difference. And there's still no sound. All right, so as I was saying, you know, it's really a, a conversation about perspective. And, you know, for as a black male who's raising a black male in America right now, you know, we have to look at things through a certain lens. And that lens often looks like either white people with good intentions, white people with bad intentions. And it's figuring out where we can communicate or who we can communicate with, as well as whether or not we are truly in danger. And that's where the big concern comes into play. And I think, you know, as we kind of go through this experience, it's important to understand that black people are expressing an anger based on 400 plus years now of oppression. I mean, the, you know, when you look back at the first slave ship arriving in America in 1619, yeah, it's, you would think by now that we would have figured it out. So, you know, of course there's a level of, I would say frustration, anger, you know, I, you, you may hear comments like, you know, when, when I was dying, you put up a hashtag or you liked the post because it's, it's that type of experience for us. And, you know, I, I felt it was important for me today to share, I guess, some of the results of when these types of things happen and what it looks like. And it was interesting because my wife put up a post this week and I didn't realize she did it till this morning. And I think it's really appropriate to share it to kind of set the tone for something else I'm going to share with you, which is a pretty intimate look into, I'd say, my, my life to some extent, but also a very um, unique interaction. So first, actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to share a screen and actually let you see the post. So I think it's, everybody can see that, right? Give me those nods, thumbs up, good to go. All right, now I'm going to read it um, and I'll roll it down just a little bit. My life is summed up in this picture. And I'll show you the picture. Just, Neither of them will walk alone without me for different reasons, but for their safety may not understand or agree with our world's current state of affairs. Unless you have to have the talk with your child, you may not ever truly know. However, we must be open to different and new perspectives in order to advance. Significant change doesn't occur easily. Our ancestors have not done all of the work for us. The road we travel is paved and unforgettable, uncomfortable. On top of the dryer. While you may be too weary for the trip, you can't impede progress. Even when it hurts, support progress, equality, and goodness. If you're unsure of what that looks like, be still and listen. I hope the only talk my son will ever have to have with his children is about sex. We will make it through this and come out better for it. Hashtag my son does matter. Hashtag my husband matters. And you know, I wanted to share that with you because I had an interaction with my son this week that was, um, it, it, it was a very hard interaction. And it's the second talk I've had to have with him. And this time I actually recorded a portion of it. And I'm going to share a portion of that with you today. And I, it's about seven minutes. I mean, the whole talk was 15, but I, I shortened it to seven. But I think there's so much in it that you will definitely walk out of it with a different understanding of what it's like to go through that talk with the child. And we were in the middle of a walk, so we we're just kind of walking. 
I'll make sure you can hear. There are always different barriers and our experience is different because if you feel like you might feel hurt on any day, you're gonna be really stressed out. Yeah. You know how last night when the storm came, you got a little nervous about that and everything? Yeah. Well, I'm not laughing at you, but, <laughs> but when that happened, you, you know, that feeling, you know, that's what it starts to feel like a little bit when you're dealing with every day once you get a little older because you start to realize that people aren't always going to see you for who you are. Yeah. And that's hard, you know. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm working really hard to try to make a difference so it can be better for you and your friends because it doesn't make sense that you and Michael couldn't be friends or, or had to be treated differently yeah. and so you know even as you hear all this and you think about it you have to look at different basically types of white people you know you have good white people and some are bad and it's been it's kind of hard to tell the difference for us you know mm -hmm. but um you, you start to figure it out all the time and, I, and I, I think there are more good than bad and I think we just have to keep
Yeah, I was respectful. Good. And we've taught you how to do that. And as long as you do that, you should be fine. What do you hope will happen now? Everything to work out. Yeah. Yeah. It's been hard right now. Like coronavirus and then what's going on now. Well, when it works out, what is, what does that look like? We'll all be too bright. But we'll all be safe. We'll be treated correctly. We won't be scared of something happening to us. Yeah. That'd be pretty good, right? Yeah. I'm going to stop it right there. Um, I want to make sure everyone really understands what I took my time in that moment. Because, um, you know, I, I, I took some of his innocence to try to keep him safe. And, um, you know, as a parent, that is just, it's really hard. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, that to tell your child that people think you're less than when you're trying to build them up. So, you know, I, I know that's a perspective that I know a lot of white people don't get to see or understand. And I know we say a lot of things about, you know, the experiences we have and how hard they can be. But I think sometimes we, we just need to open the door and let you guys really see what's happening. Because, um, you know, the pressure that it's putting, not just the parents, but also the children under, it's heartbreaking to hear my son say, we won't be scared anymore. I'm his father. He shouldn't feel scared at all. And so, you know, it just puts me in a situation where I feel like I, I'm not really being the best parent to him. And it's just not, it's not fair. But I wanted to start with that because I knew that would be the hardest part for me to get through. <laughs> because, but I, I felt like it was so important for you to see it and understand what that experience is like and just how impactful it can be. Um, now, as we continue today, I'm, I'm going to lay out some ideas for you. And as I had the discussion, there are going to be ideas that you can decide what, what you want to do with them, but at the end of the day, I hope you have some ammunition to have some really good conversations going forward, all right? I mean, that's, that's my goal. I want us to be able to walk away with that so that we can start really the healing in our country. And I think it's important for that healing to start to really put some things on the table, right? I mean, the concept that we now, and, and I'm going to do some, I'll say, translations in a sense. And it's things that black people are told or we hear and then really how it's interpreted and what it really means to us. So, you know, when we'll, we'll hear things like, oh, you know, where, where's the black leader? You know, what, what, why isn't he helping your community? Where are they at? And, you know, it's concerning for me that there's no awareness to what has happened to black leaders historically. I mean, we just saw what happened to Colin Kaepernick. He literally lost his whole career. <laughs> I mean, and it, it happened publicly and everybody know he was blackballed and it just happened. You know, so this system is created really to keep us in a position where even if we do anything, the response is swift, it's harsh and it's disabling. And that's the way the system has really been designed for us. It feels like it's just an evolution 
of the slavery that started back in 1619. And it's just shifting as things go forward. So, you know, I want you to understand that when we hear that concept of really the black leader, it, it does sound like it's our problem. And from our perspective, we did not create this. We did not ask to be kidnapped and enslaved. So to now say, this is your problem, when we're maybe not even 13% of the country, just doesn't feel fair. You know, so you're, you're gonna feel a little bit of anger sometimes when you're trying to do the right thing and maybe that black person is being a little standoffish or you, know, you can't really get a read on them. It's because we're trying to figure out who we can really trust and who we can't. And so, you know, and it makes me think about even um, a comment, um, a statement Dr. King made, and it was around the idea of not remembering the words of his enemies, but remembering the silence of his friends. And I think that's really where we are right now. You know, it's like we're, 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 we've been here. You see what's going on. So now let's, let's really dig into it and make a difference. I mean, we have things like concepts like all lives matter. When you hear Black Lives Matter, people say all lives matter. Well, yes, all lives do matter. That is correct. But I'm going to share something with you. I had, the, I had the misfortune of having my birthday on September 11th. And I remember it when it happened. And I, I was just like, great, here we go. <laughs> and after that, I remember the next year, I would kind of push my birthday to the weekend. Like I just say, hey, I'll do something on the weekend because I just couldn't really bring myself to. Um, you know, just do anything. And, you know, when I hear all lives matter, I have to, it makes me wonder if on, let's say 9-11, Columbine parents came out and said, wait a second, you, you, did you forget about us? Remember what happened to us? We, we're hurting too. Like, why, why, are you talk, why are you talking about that? Let's talk about us, right? We matter. And see, and that's, what's happening when someone says black lives matter and the response is all lives matter it's saying that and and, and you have to understand a very selfish perspective what it's saying is it matters as long as it includes me that's what's really being communicated and we need to accept that and i think we need to actually take that concept a step further and understand when someone talks talking about blue lives matter in contrast to Black Lives Matter. Of course, the lives of law enforcement matter. Nobody's questioning that. We believe that. But also, there's an assumed risk when you go into law enforcement and you are armed. And, and, and that's not the same as me walking out to my mailbox, somebody thinking I'm on my all white street, <laughs> that I shouldn't be there and making a phone call. And it's that quick. And we have to understand that when we make those quick, the actions, we are really putting our lives at risk. So we gotta be thoughtful and be more focused on learning about each other and getting to know each other and understanding each other and embracing the differences. And, I'm, and now I'm gonna give you another translation. So when you tell a black person that you are celebrating your Southern heritage because you have a Confederate flag, You are telling us that you, are, you appreciate when we were enslaved. It is not for us a discussion of just Southern heritage because slavery was a part of that. And so it's a forever reminder of where we were and who we are right now to you. So don't think that when you put up a symbol like that, especially if it's not in Georgia, for example, where that's the state flag, you know, it, it's pretty clear for us what it says and what it's communicating. And I think the challenge is we need more of our good white intention people to start calling people out on these things. And that's where it gets difficult because unfortunately it means you're gonna have to talk to some of your cousins, your brothers, uncles, you know, the ones that they make that comment like, you know, what are, what are, what are those baboons doing out there? What those monkeys doing today? And you, and you kind of just let it go or you act like you don't hear it. 
I mean, listen, it's real. And we know because it's uncomfortable to have those conversations. And that's why I'm talking to you now. So you start having ideas on how to have them. Because I believe you are the good, like, intention people. <laughs> I believe you are trying to make a difference. So I want you to have everything you can when you go out there and represent and get in the fight with us. Now, I'm going to show you another clip of something that really represents a lot of, I would call, the Black experience in America. I'm going to share my screen again. Political advice from someone who gets paid $100 million a year to bounce a ball. Oh, and LeBron and Kevin, you're great players, but no one voted for you. Millions elected Trump to be their coach. So keep the political commentary to yourself, or as someone once said, shut up and dribble. Well, he's allowed to have his view about what kneeling and the flag means to him. I mean, he's a person. He has some worth, I would imagine. I mean, this is beyond football, though. This is totalitarian, totalitarian conduct. This mm -hmm. is Stalinist. And by the way, on the streets of New Orleans, we're looking at live pictures. They're yep. shouting F Drew Brees. Wow. That's what, that's that's what this moment has done to the beautiful team this spirit is, of the New Orleans This Saints. is a great, he's a great Christian man. He's, he's, it's always on. All right. So I just wanted to share that with you because this happens to black people often. We're often told you're being treated the same. There is no difference. Everything's good. And we're told that from birth. So it, it, we come to this realization that certainly that we can lie to all our lives. And that feels insane <laughs> because you look up and you realize, no, this isn't true. And it's a system designed for us to be that way. And I think we have to understand that that has happened. You know, when we, when we look at situations like the FBI, the ATF, and the marshals, all making it clear that there are extremist groups in law enforcement and the military, there was a report in 2006 from the FBI that reported this. And yet, we act like it's not there, or like there's just a, a few bad apples. But think about it. When you look at their behavior, doesn't it make sense? I'm, I'm seeing the head nods. I appreciate that because, I mean, I, I think, it, you know, it's like you, it's, it's very obvious, but what are we going to do about it? Let's say that. A government official can't be racist. Anybody connected to a government job, at least. At least that private, you know, you want to go make swastikas, build crosses, roads, whatever. <laughs> you can do that. But in a government job where you're supposed to be fair and equitable, you shouldn't be able to be racist. So why can't we scrub some Facebooks and see what's going on? Teachers lose jobs all the time for what they put on Facebook. So why don't the law officers lose their jobs? I mean, I would think that in that role, you need to be pretty fair, level-headed. So you would think that that would be the focus, but it's clear that it isn't. You know, and we've been really put in a position where we have to accept that. And again, it's hard, but we're having to talk with you so that you can have some hard talks as well. Because I feel like if I'm gonna have that talk with my son, you can start talking to those people in your family. You can start talking to your friends. You can start really reaching out to people and. And, and really trying to make them understand. And if you don't, it's okay. You can come back, and then you have to decide how much value that person has in your life. It's funny. I think about that show, um, was it, uh, This Is Us. I, I only could watch about two seasons of it because it's just too much. I'm, I, I can't handle it. Right? <laughs> you know, everything's all sad. I'm, I'm always like, you know, I need, I need to feel good right now, basically. But, you know, the, for the for a couple of seasons, I'm like, there was this one particular scene that always stuck with me. And I feel like it's so just poignant today. And it's that the brothers were fighting. And people who aren't familiar with the show, there, there was a set of twins who were white, and they adopted a black child, and they were all the same age, and they grew up together. And I think they, it was maybe... 70s through the 80s they were growing up so now it's modern day they're older you know and so the, the brothers were older one's white one's black they're having an argument they're in the street they get into a tussle 
it's not like our fist fight, but they get into a tussle. And officer comes over and, and he breaks it up. But you, of course, we know what the officer does. He grabs the blackmail and he starts to accuse him of being the person that's wrong. And his brother said, that's my brother. Get your hands off of him. And the brother started crying. And he said to the man, this is the first time in my life you have ever claimed me. And, and I think that's where black people in America are right now. You know, I mean, we, we, we were the first foster children of America. I mean, we were the ones snatched from our parents. I, it's a lot of social workers on right now. You know, I mean, we look at the resource home we ended up in. So when you look at that, how, how did you expect us to turn out? Right? I mean, what was supposed to happen? And I think the important thing in all of this, though, is to have hope and to really press forward. And I know that's hard right now because there's so many different things that encourage us to maybe make poor decisions. But I'm telling you, if I can find something to be joyful about today, as a black man in America, we can all find some joy somewhere. And I'm, I'm gonna share what made me find that joy though. Because I think once I share it with you, you really understand why it put, put me there. The only reason we're here is to make sure that you got a voice. That's it. There we go. Don't think for a second. Don't think for a second that he represents who these cops are from all over the county and around this nation. We go out there to help people, not do that nonsense. There we go. I just want to tell you. Where's, where's my man? Right there. Where's the Where's the gentleman? Oh, I think he took off. Okay. Yeah, my man. He took off. Patrick Hawkins is here. I'm just going to tell you. We want to be with y'all for real. So I took my helmet off and laid the batons down. I want to make this a parade, not a protest. You got little ones here. You got dogs. So what's up? So listen, I'm just telling you. These cops love you. That cop over there hugs people. So you tell us what you need to do. Um, what is happening here? That's why I can have joy because I see something different. It, it's, it hasn't been like this before. So, so let's, let's, let's go ahead and get the job done. You know, I mean, I don't want, and I mean, we have to think about this. I don't want history to look back on us and say, all we did was just continue 400 years of oppression. That we just let it continue. It's not gonna be all, you know, it was, it was slavery here, it was sharecropping here, we burnt up their towns here. Ku Klux Klan harassed them and committed more. And let me just touch on that real quick. Ku Klux Klan, there was, a, there was an act in the 1800s that said, we need to get a handle on this. So the fact that they're still running rampant and doing what they want today called white supremacists, called far right, because a lot of them that way do. You know, when you see these little, the little symbols, you know, they're presenting different things. I mean, we have, we have to say enough is enough that we're, we're not gonna stand for it anymore. And that's not who we represent. We have to take the mask off of our country. I mean, since we told the world, send your, send your people, send your best here. We're gonna take care of them. We're gonna treat them fair. We're gonna do what we're supposed to do and help them develop and put them in an environment where they can feel valued and appreciated, not feel like they're different or unwanted or less than. Let's be what we said we were gonna be. Let's really make a difference. Please just keep walking with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. That was powerful. Um, and I appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to share from your own experience as well. Um, we're going to take about a 10 minute break, everybody. So get your second cup of coffee, uh, you know, do what you need to do. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes. <laughs>